Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Lugerich, and I'm the manager of visitor engagement and programs for the Army Historical Foundation. The foundation's mission is to honor the American soldier by preserving and presenting the history and heritage of the United States Army. And we are the official foundation for the new National Museum of the United States Army. Today, we will explore how the United States Army Medical Department has led the way in medical evacuation, disease control, trauma medicine, and the development of prosthetics. Please note that our panelists will be discussing their own experiences and do not reflect or represent those opinions of the United States Army, National Museum of the United States Army, or the U.S. Army Medical Center of Excellence. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Scott C. Woodard, also known as Woody, served in the United States Army for 22 years as a medical logistician. He is currently a historian at the Office of Medical History at the U.S. Army Medical Department Center of History and Heritage Medical Center of Excellence. He is a certified military historian from the U.S. Army Center of Military History and has been deployed to Kuwait and Afghanistan, documenting and collecting Army medical history in addition to serving in Afghanistan as a soldier. He holds a bachelor's in history from the Citadel and a master's in military medical history from the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. His book, Combat Readiness Through Medicine at the Battle of Antietam, The Human Face of Our Bloodiest Day, will be available this summer. Sergeant First Class Hunter Paul Black is currently serving in the U.S. Army as the Medical Center of Excellence 68W Enlisted Subject Matter Expert and Senior Training Developer. He also serves as a National Registry of EMTs representative, Army Liaison to the NAEMT Military Relations Committee, and as a committee member of Tactical Combat Casualty Care. He has served throughout the United States and South America as a combat medic in generating and operating forces. He has received numerous awards and decorations for his service, including the Meritorious Service Medal, and he is currently pursuing a bachelor's in emergency medical services from Fayetteville T Technical University. First Sergeant Michael Eldred is a consultant with various industrial leaders in military medicine and volunteers with the U.S. Army Medical Department Center of History and Heritage Medical Center of Excellence. He served in the U.S. Army for over 30 years and was deployed to Central and South America, the Middle East, Korea, and Thailand. He served as a combat medic serving in the Generating and Operating Forces. He has been involved with and consulted on improving the process of emergency care by the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care and was a voting member for over five years on the committee overseeing many of the new advances to pre-hospital medical care in the Army today. He has presented at numerous academic symposiums and professional military programs and has a bachelor's in history from Excelsior University, New York. And today's host is Matt, Seel is Matt Seelinger, the chief historian of the Army Historical Foundation and the editor of the foundation's magazine, On Point. He holds a bachelor's in history from James Madison University and a master's in history from Ball State University. He has worked for the Army Historical Foundation since 1997. So to kick off our program, Matt will introduce us to a few medical innovations developed by the U.S. Army that later found application in the civilian world. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Kathleen. Welcome to all of our panelists and everyone joining us online. <clears throat> Since its establishment by Congress on 27 July 1775 during the Revolutionary War and the creation of a permanent medical organization in 1818, the U.S. Army Medical Department and its six subordinate corps, medical, nurse, dental, veterinary, medical service, and Army medical specialist, has carried out the mission of maintaining the health and well-being of the Army soldiers and animals in times of war and peace. Throughout its history, the Army Medical Department, or AMED, has been at the forefront of many medical advances and innovations in the United States some of which have been adapted by civilian medicine. These include, these include innovations in the area of medical evacuation, trauma medicine, disease prevention and treatment, and prosthetics. We're first going to start off, start off with a look at medical evacuation. The Army's first organized system of medical evacuation came during the height of the Civil War, when Major Jonathan Letterman was appointed medical director of the Union Army of the Potomac, then under the command of Major General George B. McClellan, 
in July 1862. One of the first things Letterman did in his new position as part of what would become known as the Letterman Plan was to create a dedicated ambulance corps to evacuate the wounded from the battlefield. Following the early battles of the war, such as Bull Run in 1861 or those of the Peninsula Campaign in 1862, many of the wounded remained on the battlefield for days. Instead of transporting the wounded, wagons earmarked as ambulances were often used to carry supplies instead. Major Letterman's new ambulance corps was put to the test in September 1862, during and after the Battle of Antietam, as 17,000 wounded soldiers were scattered across several miles of Western Maryland. Within 24 hours, all of the wounded had been gathered from the battlefield and transported to field hospitals. The ambulance system adopted during the Civil War would later be copied by several European armies and adopted in some way, in some form or another, by many municipalities across the United States. In addition to horse-drawn wagons, the Union Army also used trains and steamships to transport wounded from combat zones to hospitals in cities such as Washington, D.C. World War I saw the continued use of rail transportation as well as motorized vehicles, trucks converted into ambulances. In May 1917, the Army established the U.S. Army Ambulance Corps to transport sick and wounded soldiers. The evacuation of wounded personnel in World War II continued the early methods, motorized vehicles, rail, and hospital ships. At the same time, the Army began the earliest attempts at aerial medical evacuation, first with fixed-wing aircraft, such as the C-47 Skytrain, and then with early versions of rotary-wing aircraft or helicopters. C-47s were used to transport wounded soldiers from the European continent continent to hospitals in Great Britain, or from distant Pacific islands to Australia and Hawaii. For longer missions, the Army Air Forces employed the four-engine C-54 Skymaster. In April 1944, the Army made history when Lieutenant Carter Harmon conducted the first medical evacuation or medevac mission by helicopter when he piloted a Sikorsky R-4B hoverfly on a mission to rescue four injured soldiers in Japanese-held territory in Burma. An example of an R-4 hoverfly is on display at the National Museum of the United States Army. The use of helicopters for medevac became much more common during the Korean War, with Army helicopter pilots transporting wounded soldiers aboard their H-13 Sioux helicopters, with litter carriers attached to each of the helicopter's landing skids. This was the type of helicopter shown on the popular te television series, MASH, which focused on the work of Army medical personnel at the mythical 407 7th Mobile Army Surgical Hospital in the Korean War. By the time of the Vietnam War, medevac missions had improved with the introduction of larger UH-1, with the larger UH-1 Iroquois, better known as the Huey. The Huey had, had a much more powerful turbine engine that allowed soldiers, allowed it to carry more soldiers it could carry up to six litter patients or up to 14 walk, walking wounded patients at higher speeds than previous helicopters. Medevac flights in Vietnam were known as dust-offs. More recently, the medevac mission has largely been taken over by the UH-60 Blackhawk, which first entered service with the Army in the late 1970s. Larger and more capable than the Huey, the Blackhawk can transport casualties at much higher speeds and longer distances than the Huey. It has seen action in Panama, the Gulf War, and in, and in Afghanistan and Iraq, and has been used extensively in disaster relief operations, such as in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Currently, the UH-72 Lakota, introduced in 2007, also carries out medevac missions for the Army. As for the civilian applications, every major jurisdiction and municipality has an organized ambulance system for the transportation of patients to medical centers. In addition, nearly every hospital across the country has a helipad for medevac helicopters, sometimes referred to, referred to as air ambulances. Next, I will talk about the Army's contributions to trauma medicine. One of the earliest developments in battlefield trauma medicine was the creation of the triage system, as well as the institution, institution of field dressing stations at the regimental level and field hospitals at the division and corps level. Again, these innovations are often credited to Major, jo Major Jonathan Letterman during the Civil War. 
triage, usually conducted by an assistant surgeon at the field dressing station, focused on wounded soldiers who could be saved. Soldiers suffering from obvious mortal wounds would be made as comfortable as possible and evacuated last, while those with serious but not mortal wounds would be given priority for treatment and evacuation. The field dressing station would be set up once the fighting lessened and located in a sheltered area or out of range of small arms fire. The assistant surgeon would be assisted by a hospital steward. Initial treatment, including efforts to stop bleeding, either through direct pressure and or tourniquets, dressing and splinting of wounds, and administering of opiates. Soldiers would then be evacuated to a field hospital. This system is still employed today by Mar Med Army medical personnel, but also by civilian agencies in mass casualty situ situations, such as one resulting from a natural or man-made disaster where medical resources are limited. Initial treatment of wounded soldiers largely, largely remained the same until World War II when combat medics were deployed at the squad level. Armed with life-saving techniques and equipment, and equipment and supplies such as plasma to prevent shock, pressure, ba pressure bandages and sulfa powder or sulfa drugs to prevent bacterial infection, combat medics in World War II greatly improved the survival rates of wounded soldiers. These rates only improved over the years with improved equipment, drugs and evacuation techniques such as medevac. For treatment of seriously burned patients, the Brook Army Medical Center at Fort Sam Houston, Texas has pioneered many methods in increasing the survivability of serious burns, such as developing techniques and drugs that greatly decrease infection, often the leading cause of burns, leading cause of death from burn injuries. Many of these life-saving treatments have been adapted by civilian burn units. The work of combat medics coupled with medevac flights began during the Korean War, or beginning during the Korean War and improved over the years has greatly enhanced the survival rates of soldiers wounded on the battlefield. Most recently, improved tourniquets, which had fallen out of favor with the Army, have played an important role in saving soldiers wounded by roadside bombs or IEDs in Iraq and Afghanistan. These weapons often result in traumatic injuries, such as amputations, so stopping the massive blood loss of results is paramount. Another tool in the modern combat medics kit is coagulants that can be poured into a wound to stop bleeding. The techniques and success of combat medics and trauma medicine in saving lives, lives influenced the creation of paramedics among civilian rescue services in the United States, beginning in the late 1960s. In fact, a study titled Accidental Death and Disability, the Neglected Disease of Modern Society determined that soldiers seriously wounded in Vietnam were more likely to su survive due to their treatment by combat medics than persons who were seriously injured in automobile accidents in California, since treatment varied in quality as there was no standardization of training given to, given to ambulance attendants. Once routine treatment began and with medics returning from Vietnam joining emergency services across the country, survival rates dramatically increased. Today, paramedics or emergency metal technici technicians, EMTs, are standard among rescue services throughout the United States. Now I'm going to switch to the, Army, to the Army's role in disease prevention and treatment. Throughout the history of American medicine, the Army has been a pioneer in disease prevention and treatment, not just for soldiers, but the, for the benefit of American society. In the early days of the Army, smallpox took a terrible toll on, on troops, and it was a major factor in the failure of the Quebec campaign in 1775-76. In May, May 1776, Army doctor Isaac Center introduced the first mass inoculation against smallpox in America when he inoculated an entire regiment. Nearly a quarter of a century later, an Army physician, hospital surgeon Benjamin Waterhouse, introduced the smallpox inoculation developed by Englishman Edward Jenner, which substituted cowpox for smallpox, and this became a universal practice in the United States. During the War of 1812, the War Department ordered the mass inoculation of soldiers with the cowpox virus. In the years following, smallpox was largely eliminated within the Army and the civilian population as a whole. Typhoid fever was another disease that took large numbers of lives in both the Army and the civilian populace. During the Spanish-American War, some 20,000 cases occurred in training camps in the United States, 
and after the war, a board chaired by Major Walter Reed determined the disease was spread by contaminated food and water resulting from poor sanitation in the training camps that allowed typhoid, the typhoid facility to thrive. Immunizations against typhoid developed in England were made standard in the U.S. Army, and by 1911, under the direction of Major Frederick Russell, the U.S. Army became the first army in the world to be fully immunized against typhoid. In 1910, another Army physician, Major Carl H. Darnell, originated the use of liquid chlorine to purify drinking water in the United States, all but, lim all but eliminating the major source of typhoid in America. One of the best known Army success successes in the area of disease prevention was in regards to yellow fever. Yellow fever had killed thousands of people throughout the United States, especially in the South, Although one of the worst outbreaks, a 1793 epidemic in Philadelphia, which at the time was the nation's capital, reportedly killed a tenth of the city's population. During the Spanish-American War, yellow fever was one of the major causes of death among American soldiers fighting in Cuba. And during that war, during that conflict, disease killed far more soldiers than Spanish bullets. A board commission after the war by the Army, and again led by Major Walter Reed, determined that the 80s Egypti mosquito was the carrier of the disease. Soon the Army waged an anti-mosquito war that all but eliminated yellow fever in the United States, Cuba, and Panama. The elimination of the disease-carrying mosquitoes allowed the United States to construct the Panama Canal, where other nations, such as France, had failed due to the high mortality of yellow fever. The Army also led the way in the treatment of malaria. When the natural sources of quinine, the traditional treatment for malaria, fell into enemy hands during World War II, the Army developed a number of substitute drugs of varying effectiveness, culminating in Primaquin, a supremely effective drug at treating patients infected with malaria. And work continues today on treatments against drug resistance strains of the disease. The Army, in conjunction with the Navy and the Veterans Administration, pioneered the use of streptomycin in the treatment of tuberculosis, long a major public health problem in the United States and around the world. The Army has been effective in developing vaccines against the flu since 1918 and the outbreak of the deadly Spanish influenza pandemic that killed millions around the world. In 1968, an Army developed vaccine against, the, against a deadly strain of influenza originating in Hong Kong, limited its mortality in the United States. Another disease that the Army has led, led the way in preventing is bacterial meningitis. Due to the easily transmissible, transmissible nature of the disease, Army training centers are, were prime locations for potentially fatal outbreaks. The Army developed vaccines against meningitis in the early 1970s that were later adapted for civilian use. Today, Army medical, medical per personnel are on the front lines in the efforts to stop the COVID-19 pandemic. Operation Warp Speed, the intergovernmental effort to fight the pandemic, has been led by Army General Gustav Perina. While the vaccines used to fight the disease have not been developed by the Army, Army medical personnel are being used to administer vaccines in various regions of the country. Finally, I'll conclude this presentation with a brief discussion of prosthetics. The, Army, US, the U.S. Army has been a leader in developing and providing prosthetic limbs and other devices for its soldiers wounded in combat. This largely started after the Civil War, when wounds to arms and legs often necessitated amputation to save the life of the patient. In fact, Congress required the Army to provide prosthetics to veterans who held the rank of captain or below, and the Army assumed responsibility for testing, supplying, and overseeing the quality of prosthetics. For decades after the war, the Army provided for thousands of veterans who suffered the loss of limbs in service to their nation. During and in the wake of World War I, not only did the Army continue to provide prosthetic limbs to soldiers wounded during the war, another concern was reconstructive surgery of the shattered faces of many men so wounded during World War I, to include the work of dental and maxillofacial surgeons, prosthetic experts, and even artists and photographers to create more a more normal appearance for those soldiers. Many of these techniques would later be adapted by civilian plastic surgeons to treat those injured in vehicle and industrial accidents. The Army Prosthetic, Prosthetics Research Laboratory, established in 1945 at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, 
conducted fundamental research in the design and fabrication of artificial hands, arms, feet, and legs for, military, for the military services. Sinoplasty research was carried on here and refers to, this, to a simple operation consisting of lancing a skin-lined tunnel through the muscle of the arm to harness its power for the operation of artificial hands. Among the laboratory's developments were the universal hand and voluntary closing hook, later approved for manufacture by private industry. Other advances in the prosthetic field included the cosmetic leg restorations for polio victims and numerous developments of hand and hook mechanisms and controls. The laboratory was completely self-contained with extensive facilities for research, testing, and fabrication. Later, the U.S. Army Biomechanical Laboratory, also at Walter Reed, developed more advanced prosthetic devices, including electric, an electric-powered hand with, autom with automatic grip control and other devices for disabled soldiers and civilians. Other forms of pr 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 excuse me, prosthetics developed by Army medical personnel included artificial eyes. Interestingly enough, these were not created by an ophthalmologist or a other specialist eye doctor. In 1943, Dr. Stanley F. Earp, an Army dental surgeon, created artificial eyes out of plastic compound used to make dentures. These artificial eyes were almost identical in appearance to natural eyes and could be manufactured at a lower cost than traditional glass eyes. Due to the improvements in medical care on the battlefield, more soldiers are surviving catastrophic injuries, including amputations, that they may not have survived during previous conflicts. As a result, the need for prosthetics are in great demand. Today, the Army, working with other governmental and civilian agencies, such as the Department of Veterans Affairs, DARPA, and universities, is helping to create increasingly sophisticated prosthetics that allow soldiers and civilians to live more normal lives. Many soldier amputees have even returned to active service. For example, Medal of, Medical, Medal of Honor recipient, Sergeant First Class Leroy Petrie, who lost his right hand in 2008, received an advanced prosthetic hand and returned to active duty. We've reached the con conclusion of this brief review of Army medical innovations and contributions to Army medicine. Now let's change gears and begin our discussion with our panelists. Woody, you were a medical logistician. Can you explain what that is and logistics in general? Yes, uh, logistics can be a confusing term. Um, but what I tell folks is that in the movie Wizard of Oz, if you recall, uh, that guy goes, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Well, that generally describes what folks do in logistics. They're always behind the scenes making things happen. Uh, and people like it. Uh, a funny quote that I always remember is Admiral King during World War II in the Southwest Pacific Theater. He says, uh, I don't know what the hell this logistics is, but Marshall is always talking about, but I want some of it. So not everybody knows what it is, but people want it. Uh, in general, logistics is not just supply, but it's procurement of those supplies, the material management, stock control, uh, the transportation of the supplies and the actual maintenance of the supplies or the equipment that you're buying. Uh, and then you go into deeper for medical logistics. Uh, if you can envision a medic reaching into his aid bag or the surgeon putting his hand out for an instrument, everything that medic pulls out of the bag got there somehow through Army logistics. So it's all encompassing. Uh, medical logistics is actually a facet of healthcare management. And so you have that relation with the clinical staff. Um, we deal with potency and dated items of prescriptions, human tissue, blood, and then all that involves temperature variances, FDA laws, and uh, security requirements that you have for handling narcotics. Uh, you deal with biomedical maintenance, and uh, within hospital facilities, you're also are concerned about patient safety. And uh, in medical logistics and the medical field in general, it's, it's an ever-changing technology. So. Because of that, most of the items we buy uh, or handle do not have national stock numbers. And so it's mostly commercial off the shelf products. And so that's much different than uh, most uh, army supply systems. So thanks for asking that. Thank you. Uh, next, First Sergeant Eldred, you graduated as a private first, private first class from the Special Forces Medical Sergeant's course and were one of the first combat medics to be assigned to be assigned as a certified ranger instructor. What makes ranger medicine the pace setter for casualty care and combat? 
Well, it's the uh, probably the most engaged combat fighting force in the last two decades. The Rangers, as an elite fighting force, have, have uh, a long history of building teams that are decentralized and independently strive for excellence. The medical teams uh, for regimental for the for the regiment are, are a great example of this. Um, not only do they attract a highly motivated uh, enlisted soldier, uh, but the leaders that we hire are the highest caliber. Additionally, they they do uh, a lot of work that uh, uh, the the rest of the army kind of waits on Medcom or or uh, or the uh, Med COE to to produce. Uh, they end up doing themselves, um, and they do it in a scientific method. Uh, additionally, they they uh, uh, do things such as uh, uh, taking the, the AAR from each one of their missions and, and dissecting it and sending it out to all the other teams. Uh, if they if they solved a problem while they were out there, then that problem gets uh, replicated by multiple teams while they're uh, throughout SOCOM so that they can prove that that, that was an actual solution to the, to the problem. Um, and our individuals, uh, which are led by by some of the, the most amazing leaders that there are, uh, have developed things like the the uh, the Ranger uh, O Low Titer program, which is the Walking Blood Bank program, which is now installed into the uh, the Army Medic uh, you know repertoire of tasks. Uh, that was brought about uh, you know and, and won an award in 2017 where uh, Major Fisher, now Colonel Fisher, uh, is, is now a doctor. He was our, our regimental PA and, and developed most of the uh, procedures that go on to that, uh, into that program. And that was a, a team effort by not only the regiment, by, by, but by the, uh, um, uh, the Thor program. The, uh, additionally, many critical papers come from regiment, uh, you know, things that, that uh, have solved the, uh, uh, a, uh, list of, of extremely important topics like flight medicine and, and uh, um, improved uh, uh, systems analysis. Uh, people like Colonel Cutwell, Colonel Mabry, uh, and, uh, and of course I, I mentioned Colonel Fisher have uh, all produced papers that have really changed civilian EMS in, in a, a great deal uh, and provided uh, the civilian community a, a, a much broader uh, more robust medical program. Great, thank you. Next, uh, Sergeant First Class Black, uh, Kathleen had to pare down your biography for our audience members. But you have an extensive resume, including your involvement with the National Registry of Emergency Medical. How did the Army become affiliated with that? Yeah, thank you for the question. So. The Army became affiliated with National Registry in the early 2000s uh, when there was a, an expansion to the 68 Whiskey Program and they transitioned 91 whiskeys um, uh, with, under the efforts of Lieutenant General Retired Peak and Sergeant Major Retired Appen and their team uh, to really push that through to, uh, to professionalize the career field, um, to, to set a baseline competency and something that was measurable also in the civilian sector for our combat medics to be able to go out and, and work on in, in DISCA situations and within the hospital systems. Um, and they, that, that relationship continues to flourish to this day and, and we continue to work back and forth with National Registry and improve, improve the Army and civilian medicine at the same time. So thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, Woody, what were some of your what were some of your missions in U.S. Army South? And for any, any of our audience members who, who do not know what that is, can you please explain what U.S. Army South is? Yes, sir. Um, U.S. Army South is actually a component of the U.S. Southern Command and serves as the uh, Joint Forces Land Component Command to so JFLIC. And actually, uh, the area of responsibility where they are working with security cooperation is South and Central America and uh, the Caribbean. And while I was there, I was the chief of uh, medical logistics, which was part of the surgeon cell, the command surgeon cell. And a big thing that we did, we partnered with the reserve components of the National Guard to conduct medical readiness training exercises, uh, often refer referred as med rets. 
And they would use training funds to go and go into the population of the area of responsibility and conduct you know, medical clinics and labs and teaching, things like that. Um, my particular, some of the missions that I personally took part of was uh, our enduring presence in Honduras for the Joint Task Force Bravo, uh, providing mission support. Uh, I got to go to Guantanamo Bay detention facilities, and there I did, a, I call it medical expenditure assessment review. So what if you've seen things from 10 to 12 years ago that talks about the cost for detention care? It was a million dollars at the time. I did that assessment looking at all our class eight expenditures. Uh, kind of my, my last event in Army South, which is where I retired from, was to go down and was embedded with the Belize Defense Forces, where we were conducting counter drug interdiction support. So uh, it was pretty fun. I had a good time. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Sergeant First Class Black, what are your thoughts on the past two decades and what, ha what it has done for civilian pre-hospital medicine? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, over the past two decades, it, it, with, the, with the advent of, of COTC and the Joint Trauma System and all the data that's been coming back from downrange, uh, we've seen things such as um, one-handed tourniquets come become mainstream in civilian medicine, and we saw and we've seen the tactical casualty care guidelines being adapted to tactical emergency uh, casualty care guidelines in order to address those types of situations in the civilian sector. Um, and then and then we've also seen where our, a lot of the research has been done in, in, in whole blood transfusions, as, as uh, Mr. Eldred was referring to. They, all that work that's been done is starting to drive the civilian sector where you're seeing pre-hospital uh, medicine and, and ambulances carrying uh, blood products on the rigs as they're going out to respond to trauma calls and stuff. So a lot of a lot of the evidence-based medicine that's coming out of out of the past 20 years is going to continue to to just morph and drive pre-hospital medicine. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, First Sergeant Eldred, uh, please describe what you did in Afghanistan and what you learned <clears throat> from those missions. So I was uh, deployed with uh, 3rd Brigade, uh, 82nd Airborne Division. I was in uh, first of the 04. Um, and uh, while I was there, I was I was attached uh, sort of um, uh, in an offhanded way with uh, some of the special operations and, and uh, alphabet agencies that I worked with on, on Bob Chapman. And uh, some of those things we did, we, we uh, one extremely important one was we we did some missions throughout the eastern border where uh, we evaluated um, the local national medical uh, systems and, and facilities, and uh, we focused on uh, on funds in those areas to benefit the local nationals as much as possible. And what I learned was um, that global medicine uh, initiatives in the area of, of uh, conflicts uh, and how American forces influence those areas uh, during our occupation, and, and I also learned that that we we it's a lot more complex than what I was led to believe initially. When it comes to that, we don't just you know storm into a country and and automatically uh, make healthcare much better and, and improve their their uh, you know uh, lifespan and and uh, quality of uh, of medical care. We have a tendency to have ebbs and, and, and peaks on that. And uh, sometimes the the conflict itself uh, boils down to problems with those with those events that we that we create at the medical centers. Um, and it's it's a really uh, it's a really intriguing uh, aspect of, of our jobs that, that we kind of neglect at the upper echelon of, of uh, senior NCO and and, uh, and leader. Um, because we don't get an opportunity to do that very often uh, in conflicts, and, and I think that that was a that was something uh, that that I got uniquely uh, an exam an opportunity to see. Great, thank you, uh, Woody. You have been both a history and medical logistics instructor. What have your audiences been like? 
primarily they were our members of the Army Medical Department in the Officer Corps. Uh, and in that teaching aspect, we also had international military students who were going through the same classes that our officers conduct in the Army and Medical Department. Uh, for the history portion, it was, you know, standard Army professional medical or correction, professional military education. And so for that, it was the basic officer leader course, captain's career course. And uh, one of the things unique about the Army Medical Department is most of those folks are science minded. And as a historian, you want to try to develop students who think with the historical mindedness. Uh, so that was a lot different because most folks are science minded. Um, and then when I taught medical logistics, that was actually an area of concentration for medical service corps officers. And so there they would come out of just being a, a generic medical service corps officer and they get specialized in medical logistics. And uh, one of the things I saw that most medical service corps officers who were getting trained in logistics, most of them had already served in a logistics role. So they had a lot of on the job training before becoming a student to learn the uh, what right looked like. So, but I hope that answered your question, Matt. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, First Sergeant Elliott, back to you. Um, <clears throat> your legacy what do you reflect what do you what do you see as your biggest achievement in the army um besides obviously being a, an active operator or, or treating casualties at the point of injury i think my my uh, greatest achievement's been the teaching and 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 helping people learn how to you know think in in crisis environments and uh you know there's nothing more satisfying than uh than seeing somebody use something that you gave them as a, as an educational tool um but it really becomes much more uh important and 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 significant when they've gone into a violent situation and come out uh not only you know uninjured but you know uh realizing that that what you gave them before they went in there either saved them or saved it casually. And uh, I think that's that's really my greatest uh, achievement and sense of uh, sense of achievement anyways. Thanks. Great, right, thank you. Sergeant First Class Black, uh, who, has served as a, who has served as an inspiration for you from medical army history? So I'd have to say, um, actually, Major Walter Reed, uh, because of his work and his research with yellow fever, and how that impacted preventive medicine for for the military and and and, and historically uh, disease and non-battle injuries uh, can deplete our forces pretty quickly. Uh, so as 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 those things became addressed, we we saw uh, a change to how we approach preventive medicine and how how we how we handle that. And then also in the public health sector, um, working. Working down in South America as a as a civil affairs medical sergeant, I was I did a lot in the preventative medicine side, and 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 it, and it was really nice to take a lot of those a lot of the stuff we've learned over the years because of work what he's done, and, and take it down there and and implement it in the smaller communities and improve their their quality of life and their their livelihood. So, okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, well, I have one final question for everyone. How do you see Army medicine assisting or influencing civilian life in the future? I'll start with Woody. Okay, so I'll throw this out and say, uh, as a historian, I can't predict the future, but uh, I'll try to make a wild guess as to what it'll be based on some of that uh, knowledge. Um, one of the things I'd say is that Army medicine actually tackles issues that civilian medicine doesn't have to be concerned about, or it's, at, it's actually not on their immediate radar. Um, because in military medicine, it's very specific uh, in that preventive medicine is super important, as uh, just Sergeant Black was just saying. And then also dealing with war surgery and treatment of injuries that are traumatic from war. Those are very specific to military medicine. Uh, so that gives us a, an avenue of concerns that the civilian community doesn't have on the forefront of their mind. And so I see four things coming from us. Uh, one, vaccine research, uh, because mm -hmm. the best way to have a soldier that's healthy is to prevent disease. And uh, we do a lot of human performance testing and uh, improving that. That's something that the Army's concerned about. And 
Army of Medicine is on the forefront of that. I think also that uh, the Army in general is good at rapid logistics and conducting sustainment operations. Um, case in point is the issuance and transportation of the COVID-19 vac COVID vaccine. The uh, Army manpower and transportation assets are being used for that kind of stuff. Uh, and then last, I'd say, uh, kind of alludes to what uh, First Art was saying, is that our influence on remote medicine, again, that's that idea of that pre-hospitalization. So in the civilian sector, that could be wilderness first responders or those disaster first responders that you see where they're, they're in a remote area. And for the patient, that's all they got is that one person. So that skill set that we've developed in, uh, in combat, it's going to benefit society. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, First Sergeant Aldrin. So um, I, I think Army Medicine's influence in the civilian healthcare systems of continuously stimulating and serendipitous effect. Not only do we train and disperse medical professionals into the system whose influence is felt every day in emergency rooms and in hospital boardrooms and every supply closet and ambulance, but Army Medicine leads influencing advances and changes to prolonged field care and austere locations and in route care for air evacuation and envelop developing protocols that improve the care provided at every level of healthcare. Um, our system, you know, we, we have rapidly changing missions and, and uh, because of that, we create uh, new challenges that require our frontline medic to solve complex problems with minimal equipment and do it for longer and longer amounts of time as our evacuation system gets stretched beyond their capacity. Um, I see the frontline medic influencing the civilian healthcare system in fundamental ways for the next 20 years because of all their experience and, and their experience and their demonstrated grit will, will be a force that drives change from the ground up. Thank you. <clears throat> and finally, Sir, Sergeant First Class Black. So I, I, I see just because of the work that I've been working on here recently, um, I, I see us really, we recognized a lot of things between our combat medics and then where we're going with the combat medics and, and what their capabilities are. And, and so when they make that transition to the civilian sector is we, we have an opportunity to fill a, a void out in rural America um, for, for the patients out there and, and what they do. So I think as we continue to train them, we'll be able to address some of the same gaps that are identified within the national EMS systems uh, when you get into the rural states and, and where hospitals are closing down and they're getting further away. Um, and then another possibility of sliding into community paramedicine and being that kind of that frontline provider um, for, for those people in their long-term disease processes. And um, so I, I kind of see us going in that direction in the future, so. Great, thanks. Thank you, um, all of you for answering our questions. Uh, now we will show a short video on the National Museum of the United States Army with a focus on how it tells the story of Army medicine. 